I light a candle, of which she has one copy here, and I'm been told that if you would like to order a copy, that you're welcome to do so as well. If you, we have a sign-up sheet afterwards, if you'd like to order a copy, and I'm sure that, that we, can, we can provide that as well. We read last night in the book of Eicha, Ani Hageve Ra'a Ani. I am a man who has seen affliction. And uh, we are privileged to have with us a woman who can say that uh, without any exaggeration at all. Mrs. Tregel was born in Krakow, the youngest of nine children. At the age of 16, Krakow was... I that's for you to tell? Okay. I think that's uh, fair enough. I did my research, but uh, why hear from me? It's a pleasure to have with us uh, Mrs. Tregel, and uh, without further ado, over to you. Tell us your story. Good evening. Well, I thank you very much for the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, my story is rather a long story, but it will give you some sort of idea. I have to condense it, of course. It will give you some sort of idea what life really was at the German occupation. 1939, when the Germans invaded Poland, long time ago before your parents were born, they came in very well prepared with a list of most affluent Jewish families. Amongst them was Arne. After a few days, a group of Nazis entered that home. And they demanded they want to speak to my mother. She spoke fluent German. And in the meantime, they looked around and they told her, you've got a very nice home here, but you won't be needing it for long. We command you, by tomorrow, 12 o'clock, you have to deliver all the things which we see here. And if not, one of your children going to be shot. As the war broke out, of course, universities, colleges, everything was closed. So one of my brothers who studied dentistry happened to be at home. And they pointed at him. My mother says, please, whatever you see, here, yeah, we will deliver as you command. And off they went. It was rather difficult how on earth we be able to deliver all our belongings. Cars, lorries, everything on wheels was confiscated, requisitioned. My mother was very bright, and she walked out several kilometers outside Krakow to a farmyard until she managed to obtain a horse with a wagon. To our astonishment, she came back. We started loading all our belongings. We had to go several times backwards and forwards. The last one, she broke down and she cried. Why? Whatever she worked for, she saved for, everything was gone. But later months and years, we learned that all those possessions which one had, had no meaning. The starvation, the fear, was horrendous. The torture. About two hours later, another group of Nazis entered our home. <coughs> they demanded the keys of our business. We had a textile business. My mother says, you never ask. Oh yes, everything what you've got. And when she quickly trod to the sideboard and she gave him the keys over. They're just about to leave. One of the Nazis noticed a tennis racket on top of the wardrobe. And he said, you have not delivered the tennis racket. And straight away one of them is drawing his gun, pointing at my brother. My mother says, please forgive us. We were so busy packing a linen, a carpets, a paintings, a silver, a provisions which we stored for the <clears throat> for the winter. Oh, everything you want, you you got, we want. And please forgive us. Anyway, they had a little talk amongst themselves, and they turned round and said to my brother, "You're lucky today," and off they went. Every morning we had to assemble outside the headquarters. 
<coughs> and work was allocated to us, which we weren't accustomed to. We were taken to unload huge lumps of coal, place them on buckets, and both hands were to go backwards and forwards. Not only just um, get unloaded, but we were whipped. We couldn't walk fast enough. They treated us in a most sadistic way. And then by the evening when we returned to our home, we were completely, utterly exhausted. Then segregations and people were taken to the woods. We've never seen them again. Old people, children. Orthodox people used to go around with the head in their beds in their collars. And the Nazis used to stop in the middle of the road, call them over, Yuda, come over. We have taken scissors out. And then they cut the beards, but not just cut the beards, cut it with the flesh and point it this way and that way. As a matter of fact, I witnessed one. We happened to be around the corner where this old man was called over and, and the blood was pouring down and then they kicked him and hit him until the man did not care. Good was still absolutely died then there. It was more horrendous to how much one would like to portray. It was terrible. And then they told us they're going to have a factory. They're going to be sewing uniforms and rather repairing them. They've been brought back from the front. I was very fortunate to operate a sewing machine. I learned it very quickly. And we were sewing those uniforms, repairing them. They were full of insects that had been brought back from the front, full of lice. And every so often <coughs> we had to go to the toilet and brush off from our bodies. That went on for several months. The new material arrived. And we were so relieved that at least it's clean. In the meantime, again, segregations from nearby villages, little towns being brought into the city, shot him there and there. And then they told us they're going to create a ghetto. And a certain amount of people were only allowed to enter. We had to assemble that huge place and in order to obtain a seal on our identity cards. Our family did not get it. In one way, we were pleased because we were not so locked away in the ghetto. And we were told that we had to march out several kilometers outside, 35 kilometers outside the city. So the day came when we left our homes. We were allowed to take only about 30 kilos of our belongings. And we walked on foot. We weren't allowed to go on trams or cars or Dolores, nothing. We had to wear Star of David and had to be a special position. If by any chance lied it down, you could have been shot. We arrived there with our bundles, walked into the room, consisted of one bed, a little corner, electric cooker, and no bathroom, corridor, the toilets shared with other families, and no facilities of bathroom, whatever. But we were, my mother always was very optimistic, and she said, do it what we have to do our very best. The very first World War did not last long, and that won't last long. And so be it. whatever they told us, tell us to do, let us do it. Anyway, we slept in one bed, my sister, my mother, my two sisters, and myself. And in the morning we had to go on foot to the center of the city, 
to the factory to work. That went on for about nine months. And then there were huge posters everywhere. All the Jews who live outside have to move in. The ghetto is free for them. Why was free? Because those people were previously there. They've been sent away to various other concentration camps. And so many people were shot there and there. So the day came when we entered the ghetto, half of the size of the room which we had previously. <coughs> Exam consisted on one bed, no toilet, sharing with other people in the corridor, no bathroom, and no facilities of cooking. It was terrible. Uh. And then we had to walk again to the factories. And then also were rumors they're going to create a concentration camp. So of course everyone was terrified. And then also it was very fashionable then. Two young people were very much in love. The rabbi performed the ceremony, named them husband and wife. But not that they could live together, but they felt they wanted to belong to each other. If by any chance they lived through the war, they wanted to search for each other. So Emanuel was one of my brothers and one of my sisters. And one day the segregation began of men. My brother, he had a friend who studied dentistry, and he himself studied chemistry, and he studied dentistry himself. So the aggregation of men, and unfortunately his, man, his friend been sent away. <coughs> so following the day, his wife rushed over to my brother, and she called him, she says, you know, Willek, please, would you come over to my house, to my room, and could you move that wardrobe, because it's so difficult for me to do so. So my brother felt that he's, she's the wife of his best friend. He's got to help her. He rushed across the road and he stood on the table in order to clear the things from the wardrobe. And a shot fired at him. This bad news travels very fast, reached us. My mother and my sisters, we rushed to the hospital. He's been taken to the hospital. We were waiting waiting. We weren't allowed to enter. And after quite a long time, a body has been carried out, a black, covered with a black cloth that wasn't large enough to cover the whole body, and placed on a trolley in front of us, like on my right side. And I said to myself, why are they placing this body in front of us? And I looked at that body, and I looked again, and I recognized they were the feet of my brother. You see, we were nine children, five brothers and four sisters. He was the youngest of the brothers, and I was the youngest of the sisters. And we had so much joking, and I looked up to him. He was my very favorite one. And I noticed my mother, she was on my, stood on my left side, and I said to her, Mom, this is Vilek. Oh, no, Vilek is upstairs, the operator. Then my sister came over and she looked at it. It took quite a long, long while until my mother realized this is her son. And of course, a proper burial wasn't allowed. He's been wheeled away. We weren't allowed to accompany the body to the cemetery. That was a loss of him. <clears throat> Weeks later, the women's segregation. So as it was in the alphabetical order, my sister-in-law, one of my brothers was married, and he had a child, and he served in the Polish army. And my sister-in-law stood 
in front of us with my nephew and my mother behind, myself, my sisters. And while we were waiting, don't forget there were hundreds and hundreds of women and children. And a panel of Nazis in front of us, but 30 of them. My sister loved taking out some sweets in order to give it to my nephew. And he turned around to her. Mom, don't give me those sweets. And don't worry. If the Germans want to shoot me, he will lay down and he will pretend that he is dead. Now, can you imagine a child of three and a half years old to turn around to say that to his mother? So as we marched on, they were told to go to the left, to the right. My mother, myself, my sisters to the left. And there were so many people in front of us, and they were shouting at us, the Nazis, quick, quick, march. And I turned around and I've seen so many children <coughs> and women on that right side. And I thought this said something not right. So I waved to my sister you know, that my nephew should run towards me, whether I could save him for a day or two, a week or, or so. But somehow, spontaneously, I wanted to help. And he did run towards me. And I just about to hide him. Two Nazis rushed over and they grabbed him and virtually threw him to his mother. They said, he must go with his mother. And that was the very first transport to Auschwitz. And the rest, can you imagine, straight to the gas chamber. We wiped our tears quickly away because if they saw you crying, you could have been shot and rushed to our rooms. <coughs> It was the most terrible, terrible time we went through, and so many hundreds of others. And again, we had to act like nothing happened, work and work. About three or four weeks later, we had a knock on our window. And my mother rushed to the window, and she'd seen that man standing there, his head covered with a shirt and full of blood. And she opened the door, and she walked, he walked in. It was my brother. You see, the Germans took surrender. They segregated the Christian Polish from the Jews, and the Jewish people were taken to the woods to be shot. <clears throat> and he, while they were shooting, he escaped. Luckily enough, it wasn't bad enough. And my mother took him next door, was a doctor, and he's seen to his wounds. And tell him about his wife and child was a diff very difficult task for us. But when he heard it, he said, I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to the French resistance. I'm going to fight the Germans. He managed to obtain some Christian papers. He didn't look Jewish. And a few of his colleagues, they went down the sewers in the ghetto. <coughs> and the other side, the Germans waited and they finished, finished them there and there. So there was another loss of him. And then there were rumors they're going to create a concentration camp is going to be built on the Jewish cemetery. So in order to chop the tombstones, because they had to build wooden barracks there, they used to take about 300 men from the ghetto, and half of them returned back in the evening. Why? Because they've been tortured to that extent. They couldn't chop the tombstones fast enough or carry them fast enough. That was that why they'd been shot there and there. So every day there were lots of fathers, sons, brothers, husbands. 
in the hundreds. And new transports arriving, new blood was shed. That went on for a long time, months and months and months. And eventually they told us the camp is ready. By the way, if you've seen Schindler's List, is portrayed in that camp, Plaschow, the very first concentration camp. So the day came when we left our rooms, our ghetto, and we marched into this concentration camp. There were huge barracks built. There were straw mattresses, a bunk, and a one blanket. My mother, my sisters, and a few friends, we all kept together. We climbed up, and up and below. Five o'clock in the morning, we had to stand to attention to be counted in case someone has escaped. Then we were told to go out on that huge Appellplatz, the German calls, square. We had to wait for Commander Gerd to appear. Actually, the film portrayed Zimbrade very slim, but the man, he was of enormous height. He always walked like an elephant. He used to have a gun in one hand, a whip in the other, accompanied by Alsatian dogs, Ukraine guards and SS men. We were... Men were separate, and women separate lived in the separate barracks. Regardless, they were married. Used to come over to our side, the women's side, looked, at, looked around, several lashes across our faces, and then he walked over to the men's side. He turned around, he took the gun. You haven't been shaven today. You look too stupid, you look too clever. In the morning like that, he could have shot 50 to 70 men. And we stood on the other side praying, what's going to be next? And that occurred very, very often. And then we were told to go to work. We were accompanied by the Nazis, the Ukrainians, marching through the streets to the factory. Every single day, there were casualties. On our return to the camps, we weren't allowed to go back straight to our barracks. We had to assemble the square again. Why? There were gallows built, and we waited for hours and hours. They dragged out a boy of about 13 or 14 years old. Why? Because the guard heard him think God save the king in English. Obviously, he must have been of British descent. They strung him up several times, up and down, they tortured him. And eventually, a Nazi went over and shot him in his neck. And we had to watch it. The scene one can't possibly forget. And then we were told to get into our barracks. Another time, there were more gallows built. They dragged out men because they found newspapers underneath the straw mattresses. That was the penalty. Several months later, we were had to assemble in that square and there were machine guns all around our backs and we had to, the music was playing in German, a song, Come Back My Darling. And this SS woman was enormous. She was, we used to call her in Polish, chlopka, like a man, she was strong. And she was dragging something. And she was far away. Don't forget hundreds and hundreds of people were standing there. And it looked like a large sack of potatoes. And as she came nearer, you see the girl, was beautiful long blonde hair she had, dragged her by the hair into the center, round and round, lift her up and down and down until the girl did not move. She died there and there. 
And then they told us, this is going to happen to you if you try to escape. So of course we were terrified. Then they told us they're going to barracks, the factory is going to be built in a camp itself, and no one is allowed to get out of the camp. You see, it was a great help to us if we left the camp, because we managed to obtain a loaf of bread from the Polish people who used to come to the gates for a ring or watch or chain, whatever we had. So it was a great help to us. So of course that was the day came when they built the barracks, the factories in the camp, and with the exception of one group, where my sister Miriam was working, and her husband was an architect. And um, so it was every evening she used to come over, she managed to obtain some soup, she cooked there, and brought us. Sometimes they searched and they confiscated. And sometimes she brought in, it was wonderful, we shared with others which were not so fortunate. One evening she comes over, she says, you know, I'm so upset that you so locked away. She turned around to me, and I think I've got a job for you, and I'll be able to let you know tomorrow. And off she went, tomorrow come, she used to come about seven o'clock in the evening. <clears throat> and I walked over to the window and I looked and looked, it's getting already dark. And all of a sudden I heard shots. I said, your power just threw me away from the window. And I said to myself, what is it? And I heard more shots and more and then silence. And then I thought myself, it must have been a transport, because that was a usual procedure. They brought in people which they were fit for work, and those who were not, they shot them there and there. So I told my mother there must be a delay, that's why she's not here. Then a group of girls came in and shushed in the corner. And then I approached them, I said, could you please tell me what happened outside? They said nothing, nothing. Then another group of girls came in, and I asked him, could you tell me what happened outside? And one of them turned around and said, yes. There were 55 men and one girl. They had to dig their own grave, and they had to undress. And I realized it was my sister amongst them. And tell that news about that to my mother, was very difficult for me. Now I must tell you, that night we could have filled buckets of tears. One can't possibly imagine how much one would like to portray. And then we had to carry wood for the bodies to be burned, because the Germans didn't want to leave any trace. Now can you imagine for a mother to know this is her child there? and she's carrying wood for the body to be burnt. And as for myself, she always used to sleep on that side of my arm. <coughs> and from that night onwards, until today, I always feel such a chill, like something torn away from me. It was a more terrifying experience. My sister Helen, she was working in Schindler's factory, and she's been kidnapped on the way to her barrack. She's taken to the hospital for experiments. They injected her with petrol, and they draw out her blood. It seems unbelievable to you, but whatever you hear from me today, every word is true to that extent that you have to magnify, because it was so much more to it. When I tried to see my sister, I wasn't allowed to enter the hospital. I knew very well the nurses there. They used to come down to the gates 
And I said, could you please let me see Helen? You can't see her. How is she? She's all right. That tone she used. So I guess she's not all right. And of course, that was another loss of her. So I was left with my mother and gave me some sort of courage to go on because I wanted her to, to survive. Whatever food I could obtain, I used to give it to her because I didn't want her to starve. I was hungry. But the thought of it, that she's not starving, that was sufficient for me. Sometimes I felt I would throw myself against the electric gates. But the thought of it, who's going to look after her? That kept me alive. And, sorry about it, but it's a bit all. And then went on and on. They came into our barracks with empty suitcases. We had to throw all our belongings to it. Whatever glittered, we've taken every, all our jewelry, everything, money, everything had to go. Even a fork or a spoon one had. And then it wasn't enough. My mother sewed in some jewelry into our shoulder pads. And so many other people had the same idea. So they told us to undress, and here we had to walk out like that, naked, to show that we've got nothing on us. And then off they went. Cases followed from each barracks. Then we were told we have to leave the camp, we have to walk on foot. We left Plashov. It was bitter cold. We walked through villages. The roots to they used to requisition a, a yard, a farmyard. We slept in stables. On one occasion, there was not a rough room in the stable. My mother walked out to the courtyard, and she noticed the farmers storing wood for the winter logs, and they had a little roof above, and it was rather high. And my mother looked at it and she said to me, you know, if you climb up and you put your feet towards me, to my mouth, we keep ourselves warm and I put my feet to your mouth. So we climbed up and we fell asleep from exhaustion. Middle of the night I woke up and I could not move. I was just a lump of ice. And I just started rubbing my legs, my arms, and I lift up one leg to the ground, the snow falling that night very high, above my knee, and my other leg. And then I stood up and I shook my mother. She did not <coughs> respond. Her pulse was going. And I rubbed her feet and face and rubbed and shook and shook her until she woke up. And I hoped her down. And I tell you, at that point, I felt it would have been so much better if they shoot us. Because the frost, the, the, the starvation, and it was unbelievable how much one would like to portray. So I grabbed my mother's arm. I've seen a light far away, and I said, let's walk. And we start walking. And the guards must have been asleep, because I was really hoping every minute I went like that, maybe they would shoot us. Eventually, they didn't shoot us. We reached that hut, and it was a farmer's house. We opened the door, and we've seen so many of our people slept on floors and stairs. They were cleverer than we were. And the farmer's wife came out, took us into the her room made us sit down in front of that oven, which gave wonderful heat, and pulled us boots off and socks were full of water. 
and brought in some dry socks to put on for us and some hot coffee and bread, which was wonderful. It was a wonderful gesture until today. I always think, where could that be? I would love to go back to say thank you. But I can't find anything on the map where we've been that time. Anyway, we reached eventually Auschwitz. And Auschwitz, we were segregated by Dr. Mengele, which some of you read about, and he was the one who was experimenting on people. And we were segregated to a shower room, and others somewhere else went. My mother, and so many other women, we went to that shower. We had to undress, leave our clothes behind, of course. They went in their towels or soap. Bitter cold, we walked in. Stone floors opening to the ceiling. And we're trembling, waiting, waiting. And all of a sudden, doors opened on my left. Walked in a woman, which was working as a clerk in a previous camp, and I knew her. And I was trying to push myself to speak to her, so many women in front of me. And she noticed me. And she went like that, she stretched her arm, she said, ah, you are here. And she rushed out to another door. And I was rather disappointed, I wasn't able to speak to her. And then after a little while, water came through. Ice cold water, we showered ourselves, it was wonderful. We drank it, because we were so pleased for so many weeks, we don't not didn't have any water on our backs. And then the water stopped. The doors opened. We walked out of there, and we were greeted by the women who worked there, embraced us, and sh shouted and screamed and loud. And wonderful, wonderful, we see you again. We thought we never see you again. And I looked and I said, what are you shouting? What are you talking about? Don't you know you came out of I said, where? Don't you know where you've been? I said, no, where? You've been in a guest chamber. When I heard that, I completely, utterly lost my voice. I could not produce any saliva, nothing, nothing came through. And after a little while, I started talking. And I must tell you, at that point, I felt there must have been power over powers that God must have saved my life and so many others who were with me. Of course, our clothes were not there. Each one of those women brought us a tunic and a blanket, and we walked to our barrack, the Bill Canal. Actually, if one of you go to visit Auschwitz, you go to Bill Canal, there are two barracks there, which I happen to go back showed my grandson who was sitting in front of me with the Leeds University students and I showed them. There are two barracks there on the right hand and the second barrack on the right hand, the first bunk on the right and I slept. So we walked into that barrack. There were others there but not on no blankets and no stromatrices, bare bunks. We fall asleep from exhaustion. Luckily, we did not stay there long. We were marching on again to Germany. So many hundreds and hundreds of people being shot into the gutter. And so many people just died. They could not walk anymore. We were gasping for some water. The German people used to come up, come out from their homes and brought buckets full of water. And we said, how wonderful they're going to give us to drink. But instead they poured out in front of us in order not to give it to us. So if, as far as the older generation I feel they know how much we were gasping and they know 
if you ask him if they're still alive, don't you know where the concentration camps? Don't you know what state with the people were? They said no. So as far as the older generation, I have got my reservations. But as far as the younger generation, I feel they're carrying some sort of guilt. So I only hope they will build some bridges between the nations, regardless the religion, regardless the color, and aim for peace. So then we marched on and on. We found ourselves in Leslau. Leslau, there were open trucks waiting for us. And we were so relieved because our legs could not carry us any longer. And every time I used to always push my mother first because those people weren't quick enough, they'd been left behind and shot then and there. And then the only food was the snow from our shoulders. They wheeled us backwards and forwards through Germany. And eventually we found ourselves in Buchenwald. Buchenwald was a concentration camp mainly for Polish Christian descent. And they gave up their own soup for us. And I tell you, that soup tasted wonderful. I'm quite a good cook, but I can't possibly produce the soup of the tastiest taste at that time. We did not stay there long, only until the soup lasted. Trains arrived, and out Nazis came and shouting at us, again, quickly march in. And so many to one compartment. We could not move. There were legs to, our legs, our knees towards our chins, and we were in that position. You could not move the left or right. The scream, the shouts, one can possibly imagine, and the cry. We eventually we fall asleep from exhaustion. I don't know for how long we slept. And then suddenly the train stopped. It was in the middle of the woods. The only reflection was the snow. We were greeted by the Nazis shouting at us, quick, march, march. We marched for several hours, and we found ourselves in Belsen concentration camp. Belsen concentration camp was known to us as a Vernichtungslager, the German called, finishing camp. From there, there is no escape. We were told to get into the huge barrack, enormous one. No banks, no straw mattresses, bare floors. There were openings for windows, but no glass in them. We found a corner, my mother and the girls we kept together. We fall asleep from exhaustion. We were like a, can you imagine, a box of sardines. Early hours of the morning, I woke up and I looked, stood up and I looked out and I could not believe my eyes. I've seen heaps of bodies outside each barrack. Walking skeletons, every sense of the word. You could not distinguish whether they were men or women. Heaps of bodies of children. And I said to myself, I'm not going to die like that. I woke up my mother and I said, i soon be back. And I trod out, and so many people died that night, unfortunately. And I was aiming for a hospital. You see, my ambition always was to study in a medical field. So I was smuggled myself from one barrack to another, asked, where's the hospital? Eventually I reached that hospital, and I asked, can you use any help? They said, yes, we can use a nurse. I said, I'm not a nurse, but I try to do my best. Okay. I said, could, you, could I bring someone else? I said, they say, yes, you can bring another, another friend. I couldn't think of my mother because it would have been too much for her, though she was a young woman still. Anyway, I had to memorize where my barrack was. I smuggled myself back to my barrack. 
and I was so pleased I would be able to work. So we tossed who's coming with me. So one of my friends came with me. We had a ration of bread as large as that. I had a little bag as small as that and a zip of on top. And underneath that lining, I, depict, I had a picture of my sister Miriam, who's been shot in previous camp. And I treasured that picture. And of course, my ration of my bread. So as we walk in today to work, I was very fortunate that I was, there was no guards then. There was Irma Kreze, she was the, the beast of all the SS women. And she says, Hide Judah, stop Jew. What have you got? There? She snatched my bag and she unzipped it, she tore out the lining. She did not why she tore out the lining. She thought she's going to find some treasures. She didn't realize that already we already gave up all our belongings. And then she tore out the, the picture tiny bits gave me several lashes across my face, and she says, now you can go to work. My cheeks were burning for several days. She was a woman of enormous strength. And I was working in a hospital like I would be a qualified nurse. But I must tell you, it was not only me that I was doing the work. It was something in me to help me to go along. In the evening, there were two slices of bread left over and some soup from the patients. But we dared ourselves. We've taken back to the barrack. I gave some to my mother and shared with other girls. We all had a sip of that soup and a crumb of that bread. My mother managed to work in the kitchen. She was peeling potatoes for the guards. and. The she had the skin from the potatoes. She used to bring it in the evening to the barrack. And I used to take it to the hospital. I washed it and I cooked the soup. And I've taken back to the barrack. It was very good, tasty, delicious. It was a great help. I managed to get some medications into the camp. You see, the epidemic and the typhus and dysentery was horrendous. It was very, very rife. All this, all the... One can possibly imagine people were dying like flies in the hundreds. The report came 500 people died per night. 300, we said, thank God, only 300. So I used my own common sense. They went in the doctors. I smuggled some medications to the people. Some were too far gone, and some I managed to save their lives. So every day I was confronted with those duties. One Sunday I happened to sterilize the instruments happened to be on a Sunday, and the table was just under the windows. The windows led to the outskirts of the camp. And I had to always concentrate what I am doing, because, you see, there was, we always had to act dumb, and you don't see anything, you don't hear anything. The work was given to you, you've got to work and concentrate what you were doing. So I was trying to instrument taken out, the doors opened from my from behind and walked in the wife of Commandant Kramer, who was the commandant of Belson concentration camp. She was accompanied by with um, Dr. Klein, and they were conversing in German, which I understood. And she says, "You know, they should be here very shortly, because my husband went to meet them." Then she walked over to the window, and tanks passing by. I could not distinguish what nationality they were. They had a star and more tanks and more. And Mrs. Kramer watches 
Then walked in a woman of German descent, and um, she wanted to schmooze herself up to Mrs. Krabbe. She put her hands on her hips and she said, I never thought that the British troops will enter the German soil. And as she said that, to my mind came a little boy. While we were queuing for the soup in Buchenwald, he walked and he whispered, the war in Polish, the war is coming to an end, heads up. I didn't take much notice then because I thought maybe he wanted to give us some courage to go on. So I put it, the two together and I thought maybe this is it. And happened everything very quickly. The gates opened, tanks and jeeps and loudspeakers' voice came through. <coughs> we British, we came to liberate you. The Nazis, the Germans have got nothing more to say, you be happy. Of course, the tears of joy poured down my cheeks. I wiped them quickly away. Some two officers came to the gate of the hospital, accompanied by the Germans, and the Germans have not yet been disarmed. And I gave them some water to wash their hands. And I could not understand why they have not yet been arrested. But it wasn't for very long. They were told about an hour later to assemble outside the headquarters, which the British occupied, and the, all the guards, all the Nazis have to assemble there. They have to lay down their arms. And then we felt we are free. Then we had two officers came into the hospital, and I happened to be in a different ward, and the Polish nurse could not speak in other languages but Polish, so she rushed over. She says, would you come quickly because there are two um, Englishmen, English officers, and they're talking to me, I don't know what they want. And I wore a white overall, and I came out, and I've seen those two um, officers that had rifles, they, which they confiscated. And one of them looked Jewish and the other one not. And they asked me, do I speak English? I said, I'm afraid I don't. I only know two words. What are the two words? I said, the sky is blue and the, sky, uh, the sun is shining. <laughs> so they laughed. You see, my, why, how do I know it? Because my mother had a tutor, English tutor, to my elder brothers and to teach him English. So I adopted two words. So I said to them, but you maybe speak German. So one of them, the Jewish man, said, we asked the questions in a joke. Anyway, we conversed in German, and they asked me, why do I look so clean, and all the other people in such a state. So I explained it to them. There's no water, there's no food, and people dying like flies. And of course, I must tell you, the British troops were wonderful. They took in two hours and stole the water, drawing pipes. They brought in food. Some people, they couldn't even hold a piece of bread and died. And some people, they just whispered. One, how much I would like to, it's beyond human comprehension. You can't possibly imagine the state. And then, following day, this sergeant, this Jewish one, came in with a translator. It was a Polish, um, Belgian woman, a Jewish one. And um, she translated, I should report what medications we need and food and whatever. And every morning he used to come in and I told him how many people died and so on. And I've been working day and night. And one day he came over, he says, I've got instructions from my cap captain to invite you to the officer's mess for dinner. And I was terrified because I'd lived such a sheltered life. And all of a sudden a stranger asked me to go for dinner. And I said to my mother, what do you think? And my mother was taken ill, by the way. 
I injected it three times using my own common sense because I didn't want any guilty conscience that I have not done my very best. But she did recover it. So I asked her what you think, should I go? So she says, maybe you take your friend with. I've taken a friend, we had to be disinfected because all the troops when they came in, they they been powdered, such a special disinfected powder, and not to carry the epidemic outside the camp. And the same procedure I had. And we arrived in that outside that building, and his name was Norman. And he opens the door, and I step back. And he says, what's the matter? You see, I've seen tables covered with white tablecloths and with decorated with flowers, which I haven't seen for six years. So I said to him, look, you must be expecting special visitors. What am I doing here? He says, you are the special visitor. This is our engagement party. I said, pardon? <laughs> I thought maybe I'm the influence of drink, but he hasn't. We just arrived. And we walked in, and the commander, the officer, commander officer uh, offers me a drink. And congratulations, and all his colleagues walk, <laughs> come over and congratulations. <laughs> and I looked around and quite a crowd of them, and I thought they must be crazy because I don't know the man. <laughs> but you see, he made up his mind <laughs> when he first saw me in a hospital that this is the girl he's going to marry. <laughs> Never mind what I thought, <laughs> but he made up his mind. So of course I thought myself, I didn't want to spoil the evening, <laughs> <laughs> so I let him get away with it. <laughs> and after dinner, They've taken us back to our barrack, and off they went. Following day, he comes over with his translator, and he walks over, he wants to give me a kiss, and I pushed him away. I lifted at <coughs> your shoulder, and I thought, maybe I have a baby. I was terrified. <laughs> and he said, what's the matter? You are my fiance. I said, look, you don't know me, and I don't know you. You were born in England. I was born in Poland. We don't know each other, but he was very stubborn. <laughs> and he types out the official paper that I am engaged to a British sergeant and I have to wait for his return. He also gave me a ring. And off he went. Why did he do that? Because his unit had to move on to deep Germany to search in for other Nazis. So to assure himself that I would be there for him, that's why he's done that. So of course off he went, and I was left with that paper and the ring which I completely ignored, because the influx of people from all over Europe, from other camps, if they were still alive, searching for their loved ones. Some were fortunate, some not. And so much work to be done. One can't possibly imagine a boy of brought in a Christian boy, a Polish one, on a stretcher. He had another head on his head, huge boy. And he cried. And he says, you don't know me. He turned around to me. My, his parents used to produce shoes for my family. And no one must touch me, only me. But I said, look, I'm not a doctor, I'm not even a nurse, nothing. <coughs> you need a doctor. He said, he doesn't care, even if he dies, I shall see to him. With a lot of crying and persuasion, I had no other choice. Placed him on the table. I sterilized the instruments, I put on a mask. I chloroformed the whole thing. I cut the center, and the pus just shoot up to the ceiling. I dressed it, I bandaged it. He survived, has been taken by the British troops to Sweden for convalescence. So surprising enough what one can do when you have to, but not today. So it was another thing which I feel it wasn't only me, it was something in me 
helping me to do so. And then, about September, uh, I've completely lost touch with um, with Norman, uh, Reverend Hartman of Visham. He was a rabbi in Hendon Shul. Some of you know knew him. Uh, he was the liaison, and um, uh, letters never reached us. So one day, uh, my mother was already getting better, and by then we lived already in brick barracks, which uh, the, they burned down the wooden ones because they were full of insects towards civilization. And we shared the room, two girls, my mother and I. We did not have yet the luxury of a bathroom. Uh, so we petitioned with a, corn, with a curtain in the corner, we used this as a washroom and the toilet was in a corridor sharing with other girls. And it was wonderful, very... We felt different. So I happened to be outside the building and my mother called me up and I rushed up because the tone she used, I thought maybe she had a relapse. I opened the door and from behind those curtains walked out Norman. And he holds his hand up, he says, Sorry, I couldn't come sooner because he had to go back to England. His mother had a heart attack. Now she is better and he's got only two hours leave, especially to come to see me to establish a day of our marriage. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, his determination rose again. And please, please don't say no. And I said, I don't know, I don't know you in this and that. But eventually I gave in, <laughs> and we established the day of our marriage in October. Of he went back to his unit, and Reverend Hartman took me to Lübeck, uh, to where Norman was stationed. The inhabitants of Lübeck learned there going to be a Jewish wedding. They cleaned out the synagogue, because the Germans used it as a stable during the occupation. And a friend of Norman's brought in a British parachute, took me to a dressmaker, and my wedding dress was made out of a British parachute, which I presented to the Imperial War Museum, now is on show. Actually, the exhibition was opened by Her Majesty the Queen uh, about four years ago, and I was um, invited to that opening. I was introduced to the Queen that I was the one who wore the dress, and she said, your dress gave us a wonderful finish to the whole exhibition. And, um, and as a British subject, I wasn't allowed to stay in Germany. Norman was given a compassion leave to take me to England. My very first step was Hendon, when my in-laws lived, and, um, and then Norman had to go back to Germany, and I had I adopted the way of British life and to learn the English language and to write about my memoirs in case I forget. But how can one forget the atrocities? So I've written that book for people who haven't got a clue what went on and for younger generations and generations to come. Should never, never allow it to happen again and should never experience what I have experienced. So I only hope that you and your children and children's children, great and great, should never experience what I have experienced. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Hirschfeld, for an absolutely uh, captivating Gina. Gina. Thank you, Gina, for a completely uh, captivating and absorbing uh, presentation. And uh, your um, powers of recollection are are amazing. But as you say, I'm sure so many of those images are seared into your mind that you could never imagine forgetting even. We have just a few minutes for some questions, and Gina has kindly said she's happy to take some questions, uh, but just for a few minutes because we have the second part of our program still uh, for today in the waning minutes of Tisha B'Av. Are there any questions?
Did you have any um, inventions about possibly um, uh, trying to get some revenge for the, the SS officers that were uh, holding you captive after the liberation? What? I didn't get the question. The question is, did you have any feelings of vengeance, any hope or feeling that you would like to pay back the uh, sadism and murder that was inflicted on pay you? Pay back. To punish those people, the perpetrators. To punish, um, it's, you see, it's very difficult. They should be punished by someone else really. The punishment should come above all, uh, from uh, God should be punished. They should punish. He should punish them. Because we are, you know, though I wasn't capable of doing things what they did, how could I? St I only feel, as I mentioned before, that I hope that peace should come and we should never, never experience, and we shouldn't be the one who revenge and so on. <coughs> because we are different. I feel that way. I hope that gave you the answer. Um, a lot of people in this country, and many other countries, and you know, certain groups, uh, believe that what's going on between the, Isra the Israelis and the Palestinians has some elements of Nazism. What is your take on that? Well, there may be possible that some Nazis went there. You see, it worked with the Arabs. But uh, it's a possibility they may be they adopted the ways. You see, the unfortunate Arab, the Arabs, the money, the oil, have got power. So I only hope that Israel, please God, should always be safe away from all those and should really, and I always pray and really Israel, it's, and we can walk high with our heads while we've got Israel. Therefore we have to really see that Israel is always, always our country and you never give up to anybody. I wanted to ask you what happened to your mother. When my you mother got... came over after six months. She was sponsored by my father-in-law. He was a wonderful man. I loved him like he would have been my own father. <coughs> and um, she lived with us for 29 years. Mm -hmm. She regarded my husband like would have been her son. And um, she's seen one of her great grandchildren, and um, she always wanted to go to Israel, but I just could not move from from England to Israel. And um, always she prayed she wanted to go. Anyway, after she died, I took her to Jerusalem, and she's buried there. Just one more question. Any of the women? Yeah. Yes, Sam. Um, you said that when the British tanks came, you remained in the barracks. Why did you not? Uh, why did they not bring you back straight away after they? Where to? Uh, to England or to? How can they bring us back? First of all, the epidemic of typhus. You can't just leave. Don't forget the word. A few hundred people, not many people left. They can't just take him out and take him to... It's a war, still a war, you see. So they kept you there, but in they improved the condition significantly? Oh yes, we moved into to brick barracks, and until and then we lived more in civilized way, and then until everyone some people went to Poland, and some people went uh, wherever they could. So they they got offered the chance to leave as soon they as They had a chance, but there was no... You see, those people, don't forget, they had no money. We had nothing. Okay. So with what? How can you go? You can't 
buy a ticket, the trains or planes or whatever. And we went in a position, we went, no clothes, you know, we went properly, properly dressed. So the, the stuff taken by the Germans was taken back to Germany? Or oh, yes, uh, yes. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Gina, for a very inspiring presentation mm -hmm. and Thank one you. that, while harrowing, gives me at least some hope for the future that someone of your stature and of your dignity and of your lack of vengeance and of your willingness to um, move on in life and to pray for peace rather than for vengeance is a, is a very inspiring message and one that I think we can Thank all you. learn from. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll uh, continue now with the second...